Guys, as uh, the advertising indicates, my name is Greg Roark. I am the director of STEM education here at Red Bird Life Simulations. And uh, as such, it's kind of a thing here, you know, when you sort of think about kind of where we've come, where we are, where we're going, that's what we're going to be talking about today with, with y'all here. And sort of what we're seeing, what we've been seeing, what's kind of been on that horizon for a while, with regards to changes that we're seeing here with this type of education, and that's that's going to be the things that, that we're, we're going to be talking about today. Uh, oh, hey, welcome. I'm glad you're here. Yeah, there we go. Uh, like I said before, what we're going to be doing is just a little bit of a retrospective, just so that for people who may be new to this as well, because the audience that I have is not just you. I've got guys in this room here, Tom, Chris, you know, I've, their schools and stuff like this. I've been working with these guys for years. And there are new folks out here that are, are like beginning stages of beginning aeronautics programming of some sorts. And then there are pros back here, the experts who have written the curriculum out here that so many schools use out here right now here as well with Elizabeth and, and her team. So we've got a wide range of people here at this, not to mention the people that are in that audience right back there, this whole live streaming thing out here. So remember, we're live streaming, guys. This is a family show. Keep it clean. Yeah, just saying. Yeah, Chris, I'm looking at you. Okay. Uh, so that's kind of what we're going to be doing. We look at kind of where we've been here with this whole STEM education thing. And do you remember like the very first time that you may have, have like broached the notion of aeronautics education in a K through 12 school. Can you remember maybe when that was? You're thinking about that? So for me, it was 2009. So I've been in this game for 13 years doing this. And so it's, it's like when I started with that, I cannot begin to tell you how, how isolated I felt and just how in some cases I, you know, people tell every single day told me I was stupid. Every day. They're like, oh, you can't do that. You can't, you know, what? You're gonna, what? No. In a school? Shut up. Hmm. And that's, I mean, it was just, it, it was, you know, pretty, uh, pretty demeaning at times. Some of the feedback that I would get when I had these ideas. But one of the things about being an old Ozark hillbilly is the fact that I am somewhat stubborn. And it's like, you know what? This can work. I have seen this work, not in aeronautics, but I've seen it work in other levels with this, and there's no reason at all why it can't, except for perhaps lack of effort. And that's just kind of not in my DNA. So I've been at this 13 years. Who's been at this longer? Speak to me. How long? Uh, 30 years uh, at the university level. Okay. Uh, high school. Then, We're talking K-12. No, I'm at the high school level now, but I've mentored high school classes, aviation programs, and usually the first thing is that we talk to a lawyer about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That kind yeah. Of yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, honestly, I've seen some good uh, aviation curriculum and some bad aviation curriculum. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It's out there. Yeah, I learned how to work from the witness stand backwards with all of these things that I've written, all of this stuff, all the programming, all of these things. And again, that's kind of where you start. So yeah, it is. Who's been at this for 10 years? Five. Less? Hands up. Okay. All right. Those of you just beginning this journey, welcome. Welcome. It's going to be awesome. You guys are going to be great. Uh, so again, you think about this and you think, you know, kind of where things were and, and all of the, the, the crazy talk, you know, that, that people thought that I was, I was spouting out there or starting this stuff, thinking, okay, you're going you're gonna to turn a high school into a flight school? And I'm like, well, that's part of it. Part of what I'm talking about has to do with flight. Part of it has to do with that pointy end of the airplane, but there's more. There's more to what I'm talking about here than that. And so as it started, then it kind of became a thing where, you know, and I hate, I, I'm not, in fact, I'm not going to do this. It's like, you know, you have these guys stand up there and teach by anecdote and say, well, back in the day, back when I started, that E6 being a dream. Yeah, it's like, you know, those things. That's not what this is. Uh, 
but it was a thing that uh, there, there were not resources. There weren't any. The, like the technology that you see here in this room right now, that those of us that have been around for a little while, this is commonplace. This is it. This is nothing compared to what some of you have had in some of your classrooms here as well with that. But with this, I would have killed for anything like this. I've spent more time as a computer technician trying to get these old SciTech devices working all the time because I had this notion of the integration of simulation within a ground school. Get rid of the theory. We have technology here. We need to be using this because it teaches kids something far more than just what happens at the pointy end of the airplane. So it was kind of demeaning. But in the first 12 months after I started doing this, I was approached by the board of the school that I was in in Albuquerque, New Mexico, saying, can you apply these principles to like your very own school? And I said, are you talking about building a school specifically around this type of, of uh, educational programming? And they said, yes. And I said, yeah, you can do it. So I wrote the charter to Southwest Aeronautics, Mathematics, and Science Academy. We took the old Eclipse Aviation building out there on the south side of the Double Eagle Airport on the West Mesa of Albuquerque, and we started a school completely built around the principles that I outlined in this three-page email that I sent as just kind of a thing to a guy saying, yeah, here's what I think you could do with this, never dreaming for a second that he'd think it was me that was going to do it. And so it was like one crazy thing, and so things started to snowball. People started to hear about it, other schools, states, etc., blah, blah, blah. And it's been just kind of a really, really cool thing to now, I look out here and I see the programs that are out in these schools right now, and it's just, it's just humbling. It's just so cool to see this and for these kids to be able to get this opportunity in, in this tremendous educational uh, you know, event that, that we do here. And so we look at this now, and what used to be so foreign, well now, aeronautics is kind of getting to be a bit more mainstream. How cool is that? <laughs> I mean, it really is. And I know I get giddy about this, but it really is amazing that now you can talk to somebody about aeronautics in a school and they not look at you like you've got three heads. It's like, oh, well, yeah, you know what? I've heard of so-and-so's got a program over here. You know, somebody is doing something over here like that, and that is just so cool to me that, that that's actually happening. And so to that, I just say, welcome. Welcome to the family. Welcome to the club. It's just, you know, it's, it's great. So we look at this and we think, okay, we have aeronautics programming in here. We have here the beautiful part about the integration of simulation within the educational component here for these kids. And we ultimately have goals. Every school will ultimately have goals about, okay, what's at the end of the rainbow here for you guys? What is it? Is it, is it private? Is it, is it private and instrument? Is it private instrument commercial multi-engine? What, you know, where's your head? Where, where are we going here? What is it out here that you're saying if you start these kids out, where well, I started kids in the third grade, well, that's where we would start. We would start in the third grade. I got kids started on these machines in the fourth grade. By the sixth grade, we would have them fly instrument approaches on these machines. That's where we started. By the time they got to high school and started taking the real life ground school lessons, they were ready. They were, they were ready. I was the candy man. It's just like we had to reinforce the hinges on the doors because these kids were in there beating the doors down trying to get in and fly. Oh, doggone. You think they're doing that in the algebra classroom? I don't think so. Wish they would, but they don't. This is where the magic happens, and this is where we, as aeronautics instructors, have not just a unique opportunity. This is that uncomfortable part that I'm going to talk to you guys about here today. I think you have a responsibility. You have a responsibility to push this further. This is awesome. We're here. We're here. We're, we're mainstream. What's next? Where are we going? What's the most important thing in aviation? The next thing. Why? All of that. That's where we are. So, yeah, well, it depends. So here, we're going to talk about these for just a little bit. Who in this room has heard of a thing called STEM? <laughs> yeah, I get it. So, 1983, Gardner et al., nation at risk. Hey guys, listen, guess what? We're behind. Our nation is behind other industrialized countries here in test scores about where our kids are. 
In fact, part of the authors of that paper said that if that type of a mediocre education had been forced on, on our country, we would view that as an act of war. That's the power of that 75-page document that they put together in 1983. From that came that call to arms. That call to arms being, guys, we got some smart people in here. We need some people stepping up. What are we doing? And so with that, we had a woman out in uh, a, a, a science, uh, director of science, oh gosh, was she at Stanford? I think she was at Stanford, I'm forgetting right now. She came up with the acronym called SMET, Science, Mathematics, Engineering, and Technology. So when you're thinking about marketing SMET, <laughs> we needed to kind of move that around a little bit. Yeah, attention getting to be sure. How does that look there, you know, on that school board website? You know, those things like that. So it became STEM, STEM education. So what we need to do is then to fix this, we need to have kids more engaged in the sciences, in math, more on the engineering. Why do we need engineers? Well, guess what? Those people that put men on the moon, they have retired. And there's this huge dip in our engineering. And so what's happened is that our nation has become a nation of consumers versus that of producers. Sound familiar? This is, and this is where somebody needs to slide that soapbox under me here, because a big ball bank can go. Um, and so they said, okay, we need kids that know how to build stuff. We need to do that, we need to do that. We need to tie all of this together. And they tied it all into test scores. And it's like, okay, just so that Johnny can score better on a math test doesn't mean that Johnny's gonna to wanna to be an engineer. Anybody heard of experiential education? Something like this, getting the theory out of stuff like this? Again, we need an opportunity for this, what we do here also. Show them what that tastes like. Let them have that feel for that. Shepherd them to a finish line. What does that look like? STEM, industry certification pathway. For us, private pilot knowledge exam. Industry certification, boom, box, checked. Instrument rating, industry certification pathway, boom, box, checked. And so these are those things where people, when you look at a successful STEM program in a school, those are going to be those things that you're going to be looking at. Industry certification. You heard the, uh, the doctor talk about this uh, here at Vaughn today. Can there be some work that we can do in some sort of a recognized program here in the state? I'm not a big fan of standardization stuff because I think a lot of the standardization stuff that I have seen out there lets us rest on our laurels. Okay, well, gosh, we've got it. We've got this whipped. I don't, I don't buy that. I think we should always be working harder and always be looking out there on the horizon. STEM also right now. How many of you have also in your circles, whether it be academia, whether it be in, in, in industry, starting to hear some rumblings here about the effectiveness of STEM? Is STEM really working? There's kind of a little tarnish there on this STEM thing. Because what they're starting to find, and, and I'll give you one example, and that is a, a study that was done by some graduate students at MIT, where they did the follow-on study about these students who followed this strict STEM pathway, and they are absolute mathematics savants. Absolute scientific savants. Can't get a job. You know why? They don't have the skill set. Well, what's missing? The human element. These things that we historically have talked about as being soft skills, are you kidding me? Those are the skills right now. Took a group of kids from Colorado to Columbus, Ohio. We got to go to uh, NetJets, and they were talking about the interview process. All of these, these 20 kids over here thought, well, yeah, it's all, about, it's all about flying. It's all about, well, I have this interview here, and I'm gonna prove that I'm a good pilot. And the guys are just laughing, they're going, no, no. Now, we know you're a good pilot. We've got all that stuff in advance. We see all of that. That's just, that, that's just how you got in the door. You know what we want to know? I'm going to talk to this guy right here, and I want to see if I can stand to be in a cockpit with him for eight hours over the Atlantic. Crew resource management. Soft skills. And I, I bristle at soft. Soft, I don't want to say firm skills, but I want to say, you know, <laughs> closer to getting to be hard skills, the same hard skills that we would consider to be out here, you know, can you give me a, a steep turn of standards? Hard skills. 
I think that that teamwork, that communication piece, all of that are no longer soft skills. We can't ignore that. And again, we have a unique opportunity to teach that while we do this. And it's awesome. Communications is another one. Again, I take kids all over the country, and every time that I do, we go on these experiential ed courses here. I'm talking fast, guys, because I'm limited on time. We, uh, we go on these experiential ed courses, and every single time that I do it, I get them on a big time college campus. We got on uh, Ohio State, for instance, and it was the first time that I got to ask the dean there at Ohio State, tell me how I can better prepare young people like this for someone like you. And I'm like, okay, here we go, guys. Remember the academics thing, remember the math, remember the science, remember all of this hard work that we're doing right here? Okay, go. And he said, you know what you could do for me? Send me a student who can walk through that door with their head up instead of their head down. Send me a student who can look me in the eye when they walk in the room. Send me a student who can write a report that I can read. Send me a student who can have a conversation with the student next to them. I did that on college campuses for eight years. And every single time, to a man and a woman, every single one of them, the first thing they led with was communications. And it's like, it's crazy. So it's a big thing. We look at STEM right now thinking, you know, do we, need, do we need to add something to STEM? Is there something in STEM we need to fix? Do we need to change the name of it? Has it gotten to the point now that it's just so polluted in the way people think about it, we need to call it something else? Have no illusion. STEM is part of CTE, Career Tech Ed. And I think that you're going to start seeing more and more down the road people starting to refer to their programming more in line with Career Tech Ed more so than you're going to start seeing it aligned with STEM. And again, this is just things that I'm seeing, the drums that I'm hearing in the future with this. Regardless of that, regardless of what you call it, understand what happens here, the beauty that happens in these classrooms with the experiences that these kids have. But it's also from a marketing standpoint, because guess what you get to do? You get to go back there, back home to Memphis, and you're gonna to talk to your community about why the program is that you're looking at for your school and your students is gonna benefit your community, and here's what I need from you, sir, from you, Mr. Industry. This is what I need from you to help support that. These are gonna be those things, because these are the outcomes that we can achieve by all working together with that. So I'm just throwing that out. We're still STEM. I'm still the director of STEM education. I'm just saying, just saying. You look here at the pilot shortage. That was a big thing for me. I can remember Kit Darby and all of his analysis and everything else shouting from the mountaintops. Guys, we're going to be parking airplanes. Nobody's going to be flying. Nobody listened until they started parking airplanes. And about the time that I started doing this, and I just said, Do you enjoy that flight? Oh, no, it was canceled. You know why it was canceled? Yeah, because it wasn't a pilot to fly. Guess what? I have a solution. We can start building them right here. We can start that pathway right here. And that was a big part of the early success. That was that big sexy. That was that part out there, you know, where you get up there and you kind of you hook them. <clears throat> and then I'm going to clean them and fry them on the engineer. That was, that was my plan with all of that. So the pilot shortage is there. It's still real. But we're going to be looking into the future. More on that in a minute. That J-O-B. If you are out there right now considering starting a program right now to do whatever, or in an established program that you have also out there, if you are not thinking about the J-O-B, what are we doing? What are we doing? It's got to be something here at the end of the rainbow that we get something out of this too. Why is it that we have compulsory education in this country right now? The reason that we do is so that supposedly we can educate young people to get out here to be that next generation that's going to push our nation further. That's what we're wanting. Contributing members to our society. Remember that phrase? You know, at some point somebody taught us out there like that? That's what we need. That's what we're after here. And it's our job to help shepherd them into those things here right now. And it's not that a kid can't come to me at the end of this whole phase thing and to say, Mr. R, this has been awesome. I'm so glad to be an instrument rated private pilot here. And my college resume is awesome. And I want to let you know I'm going to follow my heart into art history. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, you know what? 
God bless. Because at least I know that when a kid comes through a program like the ones that you teach, is that that art historian is going to have a better understanding of the world around them, a higher level of technological literacy than they ever thought possible, and a better chance of feeding themselves and getting them out of mommy and daddy's basement. And so it's like, okay, that's okay. We're not going to get them all. We're not going to get them all, but these other soft skills that they have learned in this class are going to help make them self-sufficient with that as well. And that's not a bad thing either, people. Because again, it takes all of us. All of us have to do that. And I also, by the way, those kids coming to me for career counseling, the first thing they hear me say, well, Mr. Arm, I'm thinking about art history. What do you think? And I go, I don't know. What's it pay? You're looking at, you know, accruing about $250,000 worth of debt to become an art historian. I don't know. What's it pay? You're going to get that back? You're going to, what's that investment? What's that? I can tell you what a captain of American makes. I can tell you what somebody over here with 12 years of experience in A&P, I can tell you what they make. I can tell you what the people who run the FBO, I can tell you what they make. You know, with that, I've got 1,500 different careers in aviation that I have in a three-ring binder. I said, here, just start putting something out. Look at that. And by the way, at the bottom of each page is a salary range. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. Here's the other thing. Educators, teachers, give, give me some hands. Teachers, I know you all are teachers. Come on, get up here. All right, now, here's the thing here. What job are we training these kids for? Here's one thing that you're not going to hear me say. There's a word. In, in fact, I'm not going to tell you what word. I'm, you're going to tell me at the end of this what word I haven't said today in this presentation. We look at all of these different careers that we have in what we do here with all of this stuff in aeronautics. But we also know this. We are teaching kids to graduate these hallowed halls. And they are, in the next 8 to 10, 12 years perhaps, if they go through with a four-year degree and a graduate degree, if they do that, into career fields that haven't been invented yet. So what are we supposed to do? What skill set am I supposed to do? Yeah, we have these standards over here. they got to test something here with that. But what are we doing? How am I making this kid self-sufficient where they can go out there and, and get into this career field that hasn't been invented yet? Soft skills? Really? Okay. For the new folks, new to aeronautics. Tom, let me ask you a question. Kids come into your classroom there in Buffalo, New York. Here they are, they come in, they see all this awesome, awesome stuff that you're doing. What other classes are your kids taking like beside yours? You know, let's just some of the standard classes. English, math, science. I get credit, they get credits out of that for my class. Okay. Gym, um, language arts, stuff like that. Yeah. So if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, you're talking. Virtually every other class that those students take out there, you are going to apply all of that stuff here with all of this stuff that happens with all of your really cool simulations. We are here with that. I've used the term remember the science. Guess what? We're going to apply it now. Oh man. It's that part of it. This is where we are unique in education. Nobody else got this. Nobody. Nobody can tell anybody with a straight face, every single class that you take out there right now, guess what? I'm going to show you how to use it. And the other thing I'm going to do, I'm going to fill in some of those holes. Okay? Can't say that around the water cooler too much, but I'm going to take care of that with that. That is why aeronautics is so unique with what we have and what we do. Everything is about applied math and science. That's the big part of it here is again. Because again, how many of you have had that algebra class and you sat there, you stared at that formula on the board and you go, when, when will I ever, ever use this information ever again in my life? All of us have done that, right? With that? Mm -hmm. Well, if I can take that, if I can take that, that lesson, have a kid fly something over here and then write that formula up here on the board and say, guess what's that? Oh, I don't know what that is. That's algebra. I can't do algebra. Really? You just did. And then you show them why. Oh, there it is. So once they recognize the application of what it is somebody's trying to teach them, 
Now then, they get the relevance of that item. And once a child understands the relevance of a certain concept, they are logarithmically more likely to actually use that information in some beneficial form in their lives. Hopefully to benefit us down the road when Big Poppy is out there in that rocket chair. That's, that's, that's my hope with all of that. We look at these things, and I mentioned this earlier, it's like the beauty of, of simulator integration in what we do is that we can also, in a very unique way, eliminate almost all theory having to do with the application of math and science. Because here's the thing in my chair, when we write missions at Redbird with this, it's like, okay, if I can't show a kid how to fly a mission right here, if I can't show them how to, how to apply a particular concept, I have a problem. I need to figure that out. It's not there. And this is the beauty about what it is that the simulation we can do here. So, we check a lot of boxes. Career, tech ed, that whole angle right there, which right now we all know is important. Check, we get that done. 21st century learning. What is 21st century learning in your mind? Anybody have an idea of 21st century learning? Not today. What is it that we're doing here? Not just today, but what are we doing for those kids tomorrow? What's happening out there? Are we looking down the road? Are we as educators looking eight to 12 years down the road thinking about the skills that you're developing in these rooms right here for those kids? But it's also a responsibility on them. They have a responsibility. They are going to change careers more than I change jobs. They have a responsibility to learn how they learn. And if a student does nothing more than learn how they learn in my classes like this, that's a home run. That's a bonus. Because they have to, they have to know, they take the volume of information that they learn in just a private pilot course, which by the way, that's how you get college credit for it. It's hard to be able to do that. And if you can do that, guess what else you can do? Dot, 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 dot. And so that's part of this whole 21st century learning thing, critical thinking. Think about some of those aviation examples that you guys have had out there right now. Any critical thinking issues come to mind? Eh, eh, yeah, <laughs> all of it, right? Okay, with that, with this, some more edgy babble. Hands-on project-based, student-centered learning and achievement. You know, that's kind of a big battle cry, etc. Well, let's see. Yep, okay, there's that. Kids out there are getting ready to either go to like a trade school, they're gonna to go to a college, gonna to go to a four-year deal, by the way. Four-year universities. Are we pumping that now for our kids, for our, our actual flight professionals, the way that we were? Industry's changed. Are we doing it? How's that gonna affect us? What is it that we do? If we have time at the end, I'll get on my big ball to rant. And I'll tell you why I why I'm kind of glad to see it. I say kind of glad because I'm, I'm, there's still part of me that just kind of wonders about some of this. But this kid, high school, you know, here we go, on an instrument rated private pilot. I'm applying over here to Stanford. Yeah, I got good grades. Things are looking pretty good. Think that kid might get an interview? Probably. Okay, they may want to look at that. Okay, commercial pilot out of high school. I may want to talk to that kid. Resume, solid goal. With that, the hard skills. These are those things like this. You learn a skill. This is your private pilot check ride. Can you check the boxes, quite literally, on those, on that with your check ride, with all of these maneuvers, hard skills, with things like this. Then we get here into the soft skills, quote unquote, soft skills that we talked about here before. These are supposedly the top 10 2022 soft skills out there right now that industry, not academia, but that industry says are important. Those things right there. Think about the lessons that they learn on machines like this as they go through to become whatever is at the end of your rainbow. Here again. This is again why, from my chair, I no longer consider these soft skills. These are necessary skills. These are the skills that we should be embarrassed if we send a kid out of these hallowed halls after their senior year, they can't hit those marks. We should be embarrassed. Oh, oh wow. Blank slide. Well, here I go. I'm going to improvise, adapt, and overcome. I'm going to hit the next button. 
Here we go. Plural area learning opportunities, transferable skills, things like that. Heard that before with this? Think that happens here in, in the aeronautics classes? Develop some transferable skills? We talk about this thing from when I park these kids in front of these in the fourth grade. And, I, and they hear, hear this lesson from Mr. R. Okay, here you are. You are the captain of Cessna 172. Mr. R is behind you with a hot cup of coffee. Okay? Mr. R likes his coffee. All right? Your job is to fulfill this mission without Mr. R spilling his coffee. <laughs> this is where we are. We approach this from this type of professionalism in the way that we approach this machine. Kids don't just run up, pull a chair back, and sit down. They do a little walk around. They check. Do I have any, do I have any kind of cords hanging out here? Is there anything that can hook my backpack up? Everything looks pretty good. That looks, oh, somebody forgot the flap switch. Okay, somebody. All right. They look at these things, and they'll do an actual walk around. They'll get their checklist when they go in here and they start working with all of this. They approach it as professionals from the fourth grade. It's not a surprise then when they're actually getting to go out there in a real live airplane, and all of a sudden, here's an expectation for them to act a little bit more professional than they're doing it now for six years. And that's where it starts with all of that, that level of professionalism and how they do it. Want to throw the soapbox out here for the big bald man? Let's talk about decision making. I did a thing in COVID where we did this and we tried to do this for kids. It was this virtual STEM lab thing that we put out there for schools, et cetera. And I cannot tell you the number of colleges that have written in or called me saying that my piece that I did on aeronautical decision making is one that they still show their classes. And the reason being, it's not because of me. It's not because I'm doing anything so great. It's just because of the importance of it. And the importance of being able to take you know, a tween, preteen or a teen here right now, who is just basically one big gland, you know, and then being able to tell these kids is to say, you know what, you know, do you ever, not you necessarily, but I'll bet you've had a friend that has made a breathtakingly bad decision. And so I'm like, oh, oh yeah, this morning, you know, it's like all of this. And, and we go through this, we go through the physiology of it. We talk about the prefrontal cortex. We talk about why insurance doesn't go down for a male until 25 years old. Why is that? He's still got crap cooking up here. So you gotta understand the deck is stacked against you. But like in all battle, you need to know your assets and your liabilities. Okay, you got a lot of stuff working for you, but let me tell you about this liability thing. It's those five hazardous attitudes right there with those. That's kind of where this comes from. And we teach them how a matrix about decision making. How do you make a good decision? Why are we doing it? It's because of the outcome over here. We want this positive outcome. Well, what is it that you need to do? Well, I need to play football. Well, that's great. If you like doing that, that's awesome. That's great. It's a great thing for you to be alive. How about this? How about being around that table at Thanksgiving? How about being with grandparents here around Christmas? Let's think about that. Let's think about those decisions that we're making and how they not just affect you, but they affect others that love and care about you. Let's think about that. So we talk about how those decisions are made and why we make those decisions. So again, aeronautical decision making, it's just decision making. And it's huge for us to do in these classrooms. The self-reliance, there is nothing better than that solo. Am I right? You guys go out there solo, you just got those kinks, I got this airplane going out there. I did this. And knowing that you can handle it, knowing that you can do it, that's huge. What else you got? What else can you do? Okay, you got that. Good, check that box, what's next? What else can you do? It's huge. I love this word, boxy. Boxy, grit. Guess what, you're gonna get knocked down. Probably not gonna like it. My question to you is, are you just gonna lay there? Are you just gonna curl up in a ball? Or what are you gonna do? How about this? I'll help you up. Let's dust you off. Let's get back on this horse. Let's figure out what through here. Let's figure this out. Failure is not an option. You're gonna fail. And that's another thing, I let kids fail. But we don't sit there. That's not it. And I'll show you the reason why here in a minute. Academic grit. <clears throat> Classes that you guys are taking here right now. Get those first two or three tests. You might have those kids out there thinking, oh, hey, I'm gonna drop this. This is hard. It's not easy. But you can do it. It's just gonna have to learn how to learn. How you learn. 
That's part of this process. So, again, I, I keep hating to say the word I as often as I have here, but I, I apologize. This thing for me that I have been introducing for years is the thing I call beyond the wings. It's to say, yes, what we're doing here is important. This is awesome. From an industry standpoint, being able to fill a pipeline with capable people that not only can do the job that we need them to do, but enjoy it, and, and for them to earn a successful living, and to be able to increase our tax base and become that, that place here that we need them in our society with that. That's great, but there's so much more. There's so much more that are just kind of beyond the big sexy that are those secondary lessons that they want. So we're gonna look at a couple of things. How am I doing on time? What time am I supposed to stop? I don't know. 12.05. Oh, 12.05? Okay, I can do this. I can do it. Okay, so here we are. These things right here, these are this real life. This is real life, right here. Here we are, 12,500 feet. The 13 nautical miles east of Eagle, Colorado. That's Vegas for all of you Highlanders out there. Right there, you're in that fancy schmancy Diamond DA40 and you go into stealth mode. That's right, your engine just quit. What do you got? What do you got? Let's think about this. Okay, A, Mr. R told me this. Wait a minute, I got it, I got it. Don't panic. Okay, I got that part. Okay, we're not gonna panic. Two, okay, float fine, fixed by the flare. What's my best glide speed? Right there. Where's an airport? Turn to it. Now, you're going to start running through all of these, this list, all of your checklists, all of your emergency checklists, just to see. We would do this actually in the FMX that we had in the classroom right there, and we would do the math and say, okay, we know that Diamond DA40 has got a glide ratio of 13 to 1. We are at 13 nautical miles, 12,500 feet. There at 5,000 feet is the runway, is the runway altitude right there. Where are we going to land? You're going to go! We're gonna crash. Okay, you guys get over on this side of the room. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then you have the one little guy in the back going. <laughs> that's public math, and that's just rude. <laughs> <laughs> I think we can make it. I think we can make it. You come with me. You come with me. We hop in the other next. And we do it. We fly. And we see. Sure, you can land in that field. Sure, you can land on that road. Sure, you can land over here. <laughs> Wouldn't it be kind of cool just to land at an airport? You have this preconceived thing about what could happen, but if you take a minute to work the problem, you learn, I got this, okay, yeah, I got this. So think about all of those other soft skills over there, all of those transferable skills, 21st century learning, the critical thinking, all of those things right here that we supposedly want out of these kids that are graduating. Oh, there's an example. How about this? You ever had a kid out there, Tom, right out there? Oh, because yeah, they don't have weather in Buffalo. They haven't got the weather in Buffalo. Oh, this just happened. Yeah, okay, so here we are. I'm out there at the airport. Um, okay, okay, I know I'm current. I know I'm proficient. Okay, got that. And then all of a sudden I'm looking at my weather and I'm thinking, uh, am I or am I not? I can hear Mr. Leach in my, in my head. Okay, what are the pros doing? What are the pros doing? Yeah, you're part 91, but what are the pros doing? Okay. Well, is Boeing going? <laughs> okay, here's my no-go, my go-no-go. No -go. Can they exercise that? Think about how they can use that example in life. Flying with Uda. Where are my Air Force guys out here? Uda, Uda. So here we are, we're flying along, we're heading out there, I'm heading from, from, uh, from Slidell, uh, out to Houston, flying along, 9,500 feet, fat and happy, following that magenta line. Thank God I don't have to know directions. All of a sudden, I kind of looked out there and I said, what's going on by old temperature? Ding, 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 ding. Observe, orient, decide, act. When you look at the five hazardous attitudes that we talk about, that we teach here in kind of the human elements of these courses, we all talk about these. Think about the differences of those five hazardous attitudes. You have four of them, of which arrogance plays a role. But you've got one that kind of doesn't. And I had always thought these are the four that are gonna get my kids in trouble. Guess what? Resignation. 
And again, these are those things that I said I was going to say that may make some people feel a little uncomfortable here right now. They're teaching resignation right now. I battled that in a classroom. So, these are the things that you need to know. To think about all of the different things that we can do, that I believe, as I say, we have a responsibility to do as we educate the students who darken our doors. Of doing this here, thinking about whole person learning. My son, you're not Catholic, my son went to a Jesuit college in the world. He went to Loyola. And it was the greatest experience of his life because he actually got to practice all of these things that we preached at home with all of us. And it was tremendous. My question is, is that amongst your schools and your community and your, your fellow faculty members, is this message getting out? Do people truly understand the power that you have? Do they know? I get all this stuff that I talk about here right now. Those of you that are doing this here eight to five, I, you know, I've got 124 kids that'll be coming through my class every single day. Greg, this is awesome. It's great to think about, but I don't have time. I'm here, I'm actually doing the deal. This is it. Guys, I get that, I get it. So here's what I'm gonna throw out here right now. It's a little different than it has been here at Redford. But these are some of the changes that you can look at. Please know, I love knowing what's going on, but more importantly, what I want to know is what's next. That's what I want to know, because it takes time to develop these things to give you the tools that you need when you need them. I look eight to 10 years down the road at where we're going to be, just like business does, with everything else. It's the one thing that's hard to understand. You go out there, and I walked around for years at Oshkosh with my hand out, talking to industry people, saying, guys, I have, I, I have this idea. I have this thing that I think can work. And John Musikai at, uh, at Aspen Avionics in Albuquerque told me, he said, Greg, you know what the problem is? He said, the problem is education is not sexy. Education is not sexy to a corporate guy who is thinking about what can you do for me this quarter? Because the things that we do in this classroom are eight to 10 years out before they pay any dividends. What we have to do in this, as everything that we do here evolves, is we have to make sure that the people out there know that we know with this. That's where you really start getting traction with all of this. These are the things that I'm looking at. I'm not going to read these to you. you can, you've already read them here again. But you can count on more communication from me as we do this. Jack Welch said it better than anybody. Nobody in this room is as smart as we all are. And as we all work together to grow what we know to be an amazing opportunity for our young people in this nation, again, I am, I, there's, there's nobody that's as big a cheerleader for you as me. And looking more at some of the professional development, nay, program development, things that we'll be doing here coming up. Point of this all, oops, I'll go back, because that was just really important. Here again, just understand that I'm watching, that I'm looking. We're, we're, we're moving where I think we're, we're, we are. It's so cool to see all of this stuff happening. These are some of the things that we're going to be doing. I will be talking to you people because I want to know not just how we can help, but how we can help each other. Any questions? <laughs> Sir. Hi, uh, Bob Eater from Nappy. Uh, first, an editorial com a comment. This doesn't reflect Nappy necessarily, but my own. Um, we have to change STEM, STEM to STEAM. We've got to, to your point, we have to include the arts. Without human beings, none of this means anything. I did that in Colorado, they shot me down. Well, they were wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, that's one. The question is that in the St. Louis area, in the St. Louis metro area, we keep having, and I'll describe it as the fireplace, uh, the fireplace on a cold winter morning syndrome. We have all kinds of, we keep lighting the fire, there's embers there, but we can't get it going. 
the schools are interested in all that other stuff. I'm involved in, a, in an organization in that area that wants to bring kids, young people, I'll say it that way, young people in. The schools are interested, but we can't get, we can't get the planes in. Any thoughts on that? The answer to your question is going to extend beyond the time which I have been allotted to keep people hostage in this room. Can we continue this offline? And here's, the, here's what I will say to you that are in this room. I will get back to you, either through Redbird Landing, where I'll be doing articles, et cetera, videos that I do on the answer to this question. This is one of the things that I want to talk to you about, is for us to have this place where we can come together as educators on this and knock some of these ideas around and fix some of these stall points that we have in certain communities. Thank you. Great questions. Anybody else? I'll be doing this tomorrow. I will be using different words. So just, just let me know. Thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here.